so I'm um, director of biocomputing uh, here at OICR. I work on um, curated pathway databases and uh, they add their application to cancer data analysis. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, um, basically give you a, a slideshow that's based on a review article that uh, I helped to co-author with the members of the International Cancer Genome Consortium's um, a Mutation Consequences Working Group, where we reviewed the state of the art for pathway and network analysis. I don't know if the, that re, uh, preprint got into the, was was distributed, can be distributed to the students? I sent it to you. It's on the wiki. It's on the wiki. Yeah. Okay. So there's a pre, there's a, a preprint been submitted, not reviewed yet, up on, up on the wiki for you to, to look at. Obviously, it's, um, uh, it's a, uh, unpublished documents, so don't, don't distribute it. Um, this is based on that. So, uh, okay, so I'm going to talk, talk to you about pathway and network analysis, uh, building on what uh, Veronique talked about uh, earlier today. So, why do you want to do pathway analysis? Well, the main reason is that when you do a genome-wide screen, on a uh, cancer cell, you typically end up with hundreds to thousands of individual alterations. Copy number changes, changes in mRNAs, uh, point, uh, point mutations and in indels and in genes, and it's a very, it's a very complex uh, scenario. Uh, you want to relate these changes to biology and you start to run up against fundamental statistical problems of multiple dimensionality and multiple testing. Let's say you want to relate changes to uh, a set of genes to patient clinical outcomes, such as response to chemotherapy. Um, if you're making thousands of hypotheses, it's easy to find uh, associations that occur by chance. You don't know whether there are truly biologically significant. So what uh, pathway analysis allows you to do is to reduce thousands of genes into tens or less of pathway alterations, which may reflect the underlying biology of what's being changed in the tumor cell. And then you can take those tens of hypotheses and relate them to clinical parameters, behavior of the, uh, of the, the, the tumor. Um, in a much more statistically powerful manner. It also allows you to find meaning in the, the long tail of rare cancer mutations. I'm sure you've talked about this earlier and seen this in your own work, that a typical, typical cancer cell, you have a few uh, cancer population, you have a few genes which are very frequently mutated, and then a long tail of increasingly rare mutations many of which are incidental, not real, but there are some drivers hiding in there. How do you make sense of those, these rare events? If you can relate them to pathways, then you, can identify, then you can increase these rare numbers of mutations into a more common set, more frequently occurring set of pathway alterations. And also pathways uh, allow you immediately to tell biological stories, to go from observations uh, to, ne to, uh, um, to mechanisms. So I'm now going to try to define what pathway and network analysis is. Uh, so broadly speaking, uh, it is any technique that makes use of a priori biological pathway or molecular network information to, to gain insight into a, uh, to a tumor or other biological system. Uh, it is a very rapidly evolving field. You ask two different people who work in the field what pathway analysis is, you'll get two slightly different answers, uh, and there are many different approaches. I cannot in this next um, 40, 40 minutes or so give you a comprehensive assessment of all the things that people are doing. I'm going to try to touch on the main points and point you to a few useful tools that you can apply to your own work. So now we, 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 we address, we, we approach the question of What's a pathway and what's a network? Okay, so I think we all know what, what a pathway is because it's what we learn in undergrad uh, biochemistry. It's a series of biological reactions 
which take some, uh, some inputs, such as glucose, and create some outputs, such as ATP, with many, many, many molecular interactions in the, uh, uh, um, you know, between the one and the, one and the, uh, one and the other. Uh, pathways can be applied to small molecule transformations like intermediary metabolism or to more complex things like transport reactions, um, you know, assembly of uh, subcellular um, uh, machinery such as the, my, my, um, the uh, mitotic spindle apparatus, signaling, any of those events in the cell can be turned into a series, a series of molecular interactions and reactions. Uh, typically, um, pathways are, and pathways are usually represented something like this, where you have a series of inputs, a series of reactions, and a series of out outputs, some modulatory factors here. What we're looking at here, for example, is the, um, uh, a simplified version of the epidermal growth factor receptor signaling pathway, which starts with um, uh, EGFR, and it's a ligand EGF. Uh, it forms a, they form a complex. The complex is active. It converts um, uh, ATP into ADP. Uh, and eventually, I can't even read this, um, is a, a, down, a, a, downstream, a downstream effector. Ultimately leads to um, in, um, increased cell growth. There are a number of regulatory interactions um, in uh, that, uh, that, 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 uh, inhi that uh, um, in inhibit, uh, inhibit these steps that enable them to be regulated. Uh, a network, on the other hand, is a, uh, um, uh, is a more loosely defined uh, 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 graph of interactions between molecules, where, uh, again, you, 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 you draw you can draw arrows between different molecules, but they don't imply any directionality. It's a series of, of, uh, of interactions of some sort. It could be regulatory interactions. They can be uh, bind, uh, binding interactions, such as protein-protein binding. They can be uh, Metab uh, metabolic modification reactions, uh, uh, um, such as a, a, a ubiqu ubiquinylation step. The important thing here is that um, the the network structure is a much more general structure in which you can fit a lot in which you can fit a lot of uh, a lot of different different meanings. And typically, um, when we represent pathways in a, as as networks, we can start to add. Lots of information, which is le uh, lots of information, which is less well understood. So, for example, in the EGFR pathway, we can convert the EGFR pathway into a series of network reactions. See, one thing you'll notice that we is that we've we've lost the di directionality, the time the time sense of things, and we just have a a number of interactions. And so we maintain some of the regulatory steps, some of the binding steps, but we're also able to add a number of additional proteins to the, um, to the network uh, where we don't know what the precise interaction is, but we know that it, affect, that it affects it in some way. So for example, if you, you can do a uh, yeast to hybrid protein interaction screen, with baits from the EGFR pathway, you'll get a bunch of things that bind to members of that, to components of that pathway. You know they bind, you know they're, they're, they may be biologically important in some way, but you don't know exactly how, um, uh, what the nature of that interaction is. Or you can do a uh, synthetic lethal screen or a suppressor enhancer screen and find genetic interactions between known members of the EGF pathway and novel um, uh, or novel poor or more poorly characterized gene, you can put them into the network, but you don't know exactly what they're doing. So one uses one uses networks when one wants to uh, get a more comprehensive but shallower view 
of the uh, of the genome. I'll give I'll go more into that in, in a second. So, regardless of whether you're doing uh, analysis on pathways or on networks, you need two ingredients, two essential ingredients. One is you need um, a, your experimental list of altered genes, proteins, or RNAs from your uh, from the, the tumor you're studying, and you need a database. Um, from which you can get pathways or networks. So pathway data, we're going to talk about pathway databases first and then we'll talk about network databases. So pathway databases are, uh, are human are typically human curated um, uh, collections of pathway information that come out of the literature. Um, they offer a biochemical view of biological processes. They typically capture cause and effect and, direction, and directionality of the biological processes, and they give you human interpretable visualizations, which, you, um, which are um, intuitively, in, 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 intuitively obvious. Uh, disadvantages of pathway databases, they typically, they only cover the part of the genome that's really well understood, so they're only capturing, you know, I don't know, a quarter, uh, a quarter of, uh, of, of biology or less, we don't really know. Um, and uh, because it's a human, uh, because making pathways is, uh, um, is a subjective process, different databases disagree on the, where you put different pathways. So you can have um, a one pathway database that will talk about um, uh, uh, EGFR signaling, to use my previous example, and another will take EGFR and put it into a lung cancer pathway because EGFR mutations are, are, are frequent, uh, frequently seen in lung cancer. So is it a lung cancer pathway, or is it an EGF pathway, or is it a pathway of um, uh, 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 ligand signaling? Depends on who you, who you are and what your interest is. Here is a very familiar example of a, uh, of a pathway database that um, most of us have used at one point or another. Uh, the uh, KEG, the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, and uh, this path, um, this is a representation of, if I can read it, the pentose, uh, phos pentose phosphate uh, uh, um, uh, uh, metabolic pathway. Uh, here is another uh, a database that uh, I work on, along with uh, Robin Hall, who will be around sooner or later um, in the next hour, uh, called Reactome. And here we are looking at which pathway is this? I guess this is again. Uh, oh, this is N. Okay, this is N NCAM1 sig um, uh, signaling pathway. Um, again, you can see see that each of the um, each of the uh, ovals here is a molecule, and it's showing a series of reactions, which which is directional from uh, extracellular signaling events to uh, cytoplasmic and then nuclear events, which uh, uh, activate the, the, the downstream genes of the of NCAM. Uh, Reactome, as an example of a, a pathway database, is hand curated by a team of curators at OICR, uh, New York University, and uh, um, and the European Bioinformatics Institute. Uses rigorous curation standards, so every time a curator puts a reaction down on the map, it's traceable back to the primary literature. Usually, a, a a wet lab experiment that was performed that that confirms the the the, um, the correctness of that reaction. Um, it's human oriented, but the but we do an automatic projection of pathways onto non-human species um, using orthology information, which has its problems, um, and it's currently up to about um, a little over fifteen hundred human pathways and seven thousand. 327 human proteins at the last release. Uh, Reactome gives you a Google map style reaction diagram, so you can get one of those diagrams, you can scroll around on it, make it larger or smaller. You could overlay other information on top of the pathways. Uh, you can uh, do a, a gene over representation online in exactly the same way that Veronique showed you, where you upload a list of genes and it will tell you what pathways are overrepresented among your gene set, and will then give you a, a colorized picture of your of the pathways with your genes uh, genes highlighted. Uh, 
and you can do uh, and you can do some cross species analysis. So if I'm interested in the pathway in human, I can see what the corresponding pathway is in C. elegans. That's also open access. Okay, networks in contrast. Um, in addition to capturing the well-understood portion of biology, which pathways do, uh, networks can cover all sorts of relationships, genetic interactions, physical interactions, co-expression, gene ontology terms sharing, uh, pathway adjacency. If I have a, uh, a catalyst uh, of a biological reaction, then I know that that, ca that catalyst molecule is interacting in some way with the um, uh, with the enzyme, so I can call that an interaction. What you're seeing here in this here is a uh, one of the early um, yeast two hybrid uh, studies of yeast. So every node is a, a protein, and, and every arc, every line connecting them, is a yeast two hybrid defined interaction. So network databases. Um, can be built via curation. More typically, they're built aut automatically by aggregating lots of information from, from big experiments. They provide more extensive coverage of biological systems. Uh, some of the larger, larger ones cover um, uh, more than half of known human proteins. Um, but the, uh, the underlying evidence is often more tentative because they come from uh, high throughput screens. So here's some popular curated networks that you can get. So BioGrid uh, covers, uh, uh, does automatic text mining from literature and then human curation on that. It covers 529,000 genes, not all from human, obviously, but from uh, many different species, 167,000 interactions. Intact is a, is a um, primarily curated database of 60,000 genes, 203,000, and Mint is uh, 31,000 and 83,000 interactions. I have the URLs of these things at the end. Uh, but there are, in addition to these three, which are some of the larger ones, there are about, about 180 other uh, network databases. Um, many of them have been collected together and put into this resource called Pathway Commons which I think Veronique talked about already, or maybe not. She did not. OK. Pathway, Pathway Commons, www.pathwaycommons.org, um, is kind of a definitive collection of many different network, data, network and pathway databases. Yeah? So where does Cytoscape fit in? Is Cytoscape just using these? Mm. Um, yeah, it's a great question. So Cytoscape <laughs> is a tool for visualization and analysis over um, over networks, it's a network tool. Um, it has uh, app, it has apps which connect to these other databases and will import them for you. They'll pull them in. Okay, and there are um, I, I, there is uh, what, there is an app that actually will connect to Pathway Commons and download the um, download uh, uh, the network network of interest. I'll show you some examples of this. Okay, so that's 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 where you get there, where you where you get the data. How do you choose what database to work with? I think it depends on what tool your tool you're using. Different tools uh, work best. Uh, different tools work best with different databases. Uh, how can you read? This was this is a, a screen. This is from came out of the paper. Can you can you even read this? Is it too small? You can. Okay, good because on my screen I can't read it at all. Um, there are three different types of, of uh, three different classes of analysis one can do on pathways and networks. Um, the, f um, the first type is gene set enrichment, which, which Veronique uh, um, uh, uh, told you about in the last hour. Uh, in gene set enrichment, uh, you basically ignore the interconnections between um, uh, between uh, genes and proteins in the pathway or network, and just group them into into bags. A bag for mitosis, a bag for uh, cell growth, a bag for um, notch signaling, and so on and so forth. Then you apply your gene set to it, and you ask, is there um, a unexpected enrichment of my list of genes in one or more more of those bags? It would, so that's that's the first and most basic type of um, uh, basic type of pathway and network analysis. Um, the second type 
adds addition takes uh, adds topology information to those bags. So we don't just have a it, within every pathway. It's not just a uh, it, it's not just a list of genes, but those genes have relationships to each other. There are genes that direct genes and proteins that directly interact with each other. There are regular there are positive and negative regulatory interactions. There are enzymatic reactions. A protease cleaves uh, its target, and you can um, uh, you, um, this, the second family of techniques uses the topology of the network to try to build so, um, uh, try to build subnetworks that are altered in your cancer data set. Um, so by using the topology information to find uh, clusters of genes which are interacting with each other more often than you would expect uh, in your data set and to draw a, little, um, uh, draw a little picture that gives you an idea of the relationship among them. So you may, for example, in your cancer data set have a, uh, an amplification that involves a receptor and then a del uh, and then uh, a deletion, which involves a negative regulator regulator of that um, uh, of that receptor, giving you two two hits, which both give the same direction of of uh, uh, activating uh, constitutively activating that that receptor. Um, the third type of it, and that's that that in this figure we're calling it de novo subnetwork construction uh, and clustering. Um, the third type is uh, more of systems biology. It's pathway-based uh, uh, modeling, where you're actually building a, um, a kinetic model which captures all the relationships among the, among the genes and, and attempts to create a, a quantitative model of how the mutations that you have observed, or the alterations you have observed in your data set, are leading to altered pathway activities. And each of these techniques, as we go from one to three, uh, it goes from uh, most simple to most complex, and also harder to use and interpret. So number one, we've already covered. We're not going to go. We're not going to go over this again. Just to say that it's easily the most popular uh, form of pathway network analysis. Um, it's very, uh, relatively easy to perform. Um, there are many, many tools that, that uh, do, um, do, uh, that, uh, do gene set enrichment type based analyses. The statistical models are very well worked out. Uh, the disadvantages are uh, you, can, you can slice and dice the genome in many different ways. Uh, what, um, how, to, how you do that will affect your, your output. You typically end up with, um, as, as Veronique showed you, multiple enriched uh, pathways which are related to each other in some way. So you'd have to do another step in which you take the many, the, 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 the many enriched gene sets that you get and put them back together and Veronique showed you the enrich, uh, um, enrichment maps, I assume. Yes? The nice enrichment maps. So that's another step you have to do. Um, and uh, it can be difficult to go to go the next step from an, uh, an enriched gene set to understanding the mechanism that explains the tumor phenotype. So that's all I'm going to say about, about um, uh, gene set enrichment. Um, now I'm going to spend a little time talking about de novo sub subnetwork construction and clustering. So uh, the, the way this works is it starts with a network. It's not a pathway, but one of these, one of these large, um, uh, large networks of interactions. And you apply your list of, of altered entities, genes, proteins, RNAs, to that network to identify um, uh, topologically unlike, unlikely configurations. So you have a vast network of all of biology, or all, all known biology, and you discover that your mutated genes occupy a, a, a little corner of that, of that interaction map. What is um, can you find uh, these techniques attempt to find these unlikely clusters, extract them, and build little models for you to look to to look at uh, and and annotate? 
Here's an example from the Reactome um, functional interaction uh, Cytoscape app, which Robin will which Robin will lead you through. Uh, the way this app the way this app works is uh, it is using a network that has been built bef uh, has been previously built for you, consisting of network interactions extracted from uh, curated pathway databases, Reactome plus KEG and several other um, pathway databases, uh, a large number of uncurated um, uh, interaction networks, and uh, we've built for you a, uh, a, a f what we're what we call the Reactome functional interaction network. It consists of a little more than half of the. Um, uh, annotated proteins, 11,000 proteins, 270,000 interactions. It's a relatively large network. And what the uh, app lets you do is to upload a list of your genes. It'll do name translation and so forth, uh, ID identification, and extract from this big network of 11,000 proteins uh, uh, the subnetworks which are involved by the, uh, by the genes that you uploaded, and then it will do clustering. And it will turn um, the hundreds of hundreds of genes, typically into a small number of high related disease modules, typically 10, 10 to 30. And then it'll lead. Then you can annotate these clusters, giving a, a map like the one shown down here, which shows you the um, the putative function of each of these modules. It's somewhat like the um, the enrichment map but done in reverse. Instead of starting with pathways and then relating those pathways together, enriched pathways and relating them together uh, into clusters of pathways, which is what in the rich map does, it starts out agnostic to the names of pathways and just looks at the interactions among them, regulatory and physical interactions among them, extracts out cl clusters of highly interacting genes that are touched by the, the alter genes that you're working with in your system, and then annotates those with pathways to give, a, give a, what ends up being a very similar picture. So here's an example of this in action. Here's the FI, here is a little corner of the FI network uh, showing uh, that there's actually a lot of, a lot of substructure in, in, uh, in just the wild type network. Each of these little clusters that we're seeing is a, um, is, is a group of highly interacting genes. Uh, things like the ribosome end up forming balls like this. And here is a, a typical data set. This is uh, a 52 pancreatic cancer genomes uh, sequenced last year uh, at OICR. And what we're looking at are genes going this way and the frequency of, mu of non-synonymous mutations in those genes uh, in the y-axis. And it shows, this is a very typical, um, very typical graph, it shows that there are some genes like KRAS and P53, which are very highly frequently mutated, and then there's a very rapid drop-off in its very, very long tail, it goes way out to the right, of mutations which are occur in, a, in just a few samples but are not highly, re highly recurrent. How do you make sense out of that? Well, using the Reactome um, functional interaction app, you can generate a, a, a picture like this. So basically, it's extracted all the genes that were, uh, that were in, that, in, in the head and the long tail, um, clustered them together, and then annot annotated them, showing that there's a, a large cluster of genes that are include KRAS, but many other genes that are in the tail, which are interacting with KRAS more frequently than you would expect by chance, and involves um, the, the um, uh, EGFR pathway, F FGF uh, receptor, axon guidance, and ERB b signaling. Uh, another module is P53 and proteins that uh, interact with it. Hedgehog is coming up, calcium signaling, the spliceosome, uh, is overrepresented in the tail, Wnt and Gadherin signaling, axon guidance, which comes up over and over again in different cancer types. These all kind of just, just fall out. And you can zoom now, zoom into this, start to look at where the positive and negative regulatory interactions are, 
have this overlaid on top of the reactome, um, reactome pathways and to start to tell stories about what, what you're seeing in that long tail. So it's a nice visualization system. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, if you were to, if you take a, uh, if you take a random set of genes, you don't get a picture, you don't get a picture like this one. Yeah, so that the, what the tool, d tool lets you do is to do a permutation test and ask how many times with a random set of genes you would get, you would get a module of this size with this annotation. So you can actually put p-values on, on them. And there are some pathways which, um, uh, in, in fact, like this module 7, which is extracellular matrix, this one, this one typically is not significant. It doesn't, um, it, it will come up randomly many times because of the, uh, because uh, actually because it, it tends to be a group of genes which are longer and have a higher mutation rate. They tend to be false positives in the, in the uh, underlying data. Okay, yes? So for each cluster, uh, do you assign by hand, for example, module 10 supplies or so? Yeah. Or does it have a cluster representative? Yeah, so the way, the way this works is, um, the uh, so it's it's a multi uh, the the cytoscape tool gives you uh, can leads you through several steps. First step um, is uh, uh, you you extract ex extract the uh, the subnetwork from the the whole one the, from the the uh, ones that involve genes of interest. And then there's a second step of clustering that gives you the cluster map. And there's a third step of annotation where it does an enrichment, um, a gene set enrichment for each module, and then will uh, and and then will will assign a series of enriched pathways to each module, and that's what this representation is. This is after that that third step. So there's an extract step, a cluster step, and an annotate step, and you can choose to an annotate it with go terms, which is what we're seeing here, or with pathway names. Uh, or with subcellular localization, again, instead of annotating individual genes the way you would in uh, an enrichment map, you're making the modules first and then annotating the modules. Okay. Uh, sometimes, but sometimes these modules uh, um, are um, uh, give you insight into into the. Uh, 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 into the into the tumor tumor biology and clinical correlation. So one thing you can do, and this is a tool that's built into the the uh, Reactome plugin, it's the Cytoscape plugin, is you can take each of these modules, and if you have patient survival data or response data, uh, uh, automatically uh, check each module to see if they correlate to a clinical clinical parameter. So it'll, for example, draw Kaplan-Meier curves for you and give you um, a, a, a Cox pH um, a hazard ratio and p-value for each module. Uh, another thing that you could do is uh, to, uh, to use the modules for a, uh, uh, to cluster the modules themselves. So when we take the, the pancreatic uh, cancer modules and do a hierarchical clustering on them, we're looking here on the modules where we've color coded each uh, modules are going across the x axis and individual patient samples are going across the y axis. Each patient has a different subset of uh, mutations in each of in each of the modules. So you color code the modules by the number uh, um, the number of mutations that particular patient has in the genes that belong to those modules, and then you cluster then you cluster those. And what this ends up revealing is that in the pancreatic cancer data set, when you look at, uh, when you look at um, the frequency of module mutations, mutations in a module context, you actually end up with four different uh, pathway-based subtypes of the tumor. Starting at, here's, here's one which is uh, KRAS negative, P53 negative, SMAD4 negative, um, axon guidance positive. Uh, type 2 is KRAS positive, P53 pathway positive, um, and actually I take this back, this is calcium signaling positive. 
and so on and so on and so forth, this pattern is, complete, was, is completely not observed when you look at individual genes because it's obscured by the long tail. When you bring the long tail information in, suddenly the pattern appears. So let, I'll talk, give you, that, that's an example of a network clustering algorithm. There are many others. One that I'm very fond of is Gene Mania from the Bader group. And Yuri has worked on it, I believe. No, never worked on it. Or your, but your, yours, yours is hypermodules is coming up. Yes, I'm sorry, there's a question? Um, so these five tumor, four tumor types are based on the mutation profile that they create. Yeah. Yeah. So we took the mutation profile from each individual patient, projected those onto the modules, um, and then scored each module for each patient based on the number of mutations that patient had in that, mo um, in that module. So they might have had, let's talk, we'll talk about KRAS. They, they have a KRAS mutation, and then they may have had three other mutations affecting three other genes in that module. So that would get a high score. Uh, if they had no mutations in the module, it gets a low score. And then once you have scored each module for each patient, you, you, you put them into a matrix and you, uh, uh, you do a hierarchical clustering. And, and that's where, that, and that's where this, this pattern emerges. Do you think 52 number of patients are enough to create this type of model solution? Well, it depends on the strength. On the strength. This, so um, we, we, started at, we started doing this when there were 20 patients. We now have over uh, 300 patients, and the same four subtypes have continued to come out. So in this case, it was, very, it was very robust, but I can't promise that the next tumor type it, it would be this clear. The other thing I'd say is that, of course, when we first saw this, they said, oh, this is great. Now let's see if there's any difference in um, gemcitabine response or patient uh, disease-free survival. None of these four types seem to have any effect on this, except for type number one, which has a much better survival. And those turn out not to be um, have pancreatic ductal adenocarcinomas at all. They're endocrine carcinomas and ampullary carcinomas, which were misdiagnosed. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting difference there. Um, but uh, this this had no this had no influence on um, uh, on patient survival for the the, the, the ductal adenocarcinomas. Uh, the, um, I have another example that I didn't put in here from breast, from breast cancer where we, did, uh, we made a similar module map for breast cancer and then checked each module for uh, correlation with disease-free survival and we actually found a module that has a huge, huge effect. It involves the Aurora kinase B signaling pathway um, uh, and is a, 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 a very robust biomarker for uh, poor survival in estrogen receptor positive patients. I didn't didn't put it up here for, uh, uh, for in the interest of brevity. Other questions before I move on? Other network? Yeah. Like any mutation within that module or a certain number? Yeah. So what well, we use very we used a very simple scoring system, which is just based on the for in an individual patient. Uh, what the, this, so this was, a, we used a, it was an RNA-based uh, biomarker in this case. Um, we uh, averaged the, uh, um, averaged the fold change across all the genes in the module, and that became the score for the module. And that turned out to be a very robust biomarker for estrogen receptor positive survival. Uh, stronger, in fact, actually, it's kind of interesting because patients who have um, high expression of the genes in this Aurora B kinase module um, have the same prognosis as if they were triple negative. So it's picking up a group, a subset of patients in the estrogen receptor positive group who usually have a good prognosis, who have just as poor a prognosis as the triple negative patients. So it's kind of a Clinically, maybe it might might be very uh, might be useful. Yeah. This one. This. That one. Yeah. Okay. Well, so each line. 
is a uh, is a functional interaction between two genes. Um, the uh, some lines are derived from pathways, and so we know precisely what that line means. It's a catalytic relationship. It's a binding relationship. It's a phosphorylation or or ubiquinylation event, uh, and others. Are, um, are, are, are based on l uncurated high throughput data like these two hybrid experiments or proteomics pull downs or literature co occurrence. And all the, that, actually, the detailed information is available in Cytoscape. You click on the line and it tells you what the evidence for it is. And the distances don't mean anything. They're just we just they're just they're just laid out to uh, um, uh, uh, they're uh, they're just la laid out to be attractive. So uh, why is there any information regarding the uh, code distance of the cell simultaneous mutations of genes assigned to any cluster? Yeah, that would uh, so. It would be a very cool feature to overlay on top of this co-occurrence and mutual um, uh, and mutual exclusion uh, data, so that you could see, for example, that two that in a single patient you always have to have modules zero and one mutated, but currently that isn't that, that um, you would have to do that uh, on on your own. You have to do it manually. Uh, Sergey. Yeah, the, the, each, each line has a probability associated with it, with the curated ones be having a probability of one out of hybris. Any, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. You want me to go back to here? Okay. Yeah. Mm. Sure. How is the uncurated interaction evidence um, uh, um, constructed? Uh, so I, I took out some slides that describe how we made this, but basically we took um, uh, multiple sources, multiple sources of evidence. Um, consisting of a uh, series of proteomics experiments, high throughput proteomics experiments um, from uh, my, um, uh, um, messenger RNA co-expression data from GL, all of GL went into this, um, literature co-occurrence, um, uh, um, experimental models in, in yeast C. elegans and Drosophila, so suppressor enhancer screens, uh, and uh, some encode and encode data for transcription factors and their bindings uh, and their uh, um, cis regulatory sites. Uh, built a big interaction network which contains a lot of false positives because this data is is, is unreliable. Um, and then we built a machine learning system based on curated interactions to weight each interaction by, uh, by the amount of evidence it has. So, it, you know, in the end we call a reaction uh, or an interaction uh, likely uh, if it's supported by multiple sources of, ev of evidence. It shares go terms, there's a yeast 2 hybrid experiment that supports it, uh, and the genes co-occur in the same molecular compartment, for example, okay, according to what the machine learning system tells us. And we kind of weighted it, so we kind of set the bound, the threshold so that we have a low rate of false positives. So when we apply it to a, a test data, uh, an evaluation data set, we have fewer than 5% false positives in, in call and known, uh, out known, um, uh, known curated interactions. Okay, I'm going to move on. Okay. Hey, so clustering algorithms, gene mania. Um, it is a uh, it's a web website that's put together by Quade Morris and uh, Gary Bader, both of University of Toronto. Uh, 
it is a repository of something like a hundred thousand networks that have been that have been published, uh, and it is a, it is designed to. Um, uh, uh, for you to upload uh, members of an uh, 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 interesting set of genes, and then it'll make a, uh, subnetworks for you and find other genes which, which seem to belong in your set. So you give it genes A, B, and C, and it'll find genes D, E, and F, which are more related to them than you would expect by, very, expect by chance. And it's very useful for trying to assign a function to a group of genes. Um, Hotnet from Ben Raphael's lab is uses a much more sophisticated clustering algorithm than Reactome uses. Uh, so React the, the the default clustering algorithm uh, in the Reactome uh, app is a uh, is very very fast, so it can be used interactively. Um, but it gets hung up on genes like p53, which have lots and lots of interactions because they've been studied so heavily. And so the, you, know, you tend to find the p53 module no matter what you look at. Um, Hotnet uses a model in which uh, it represents the network as a, a, a metal mesh. And the genes that are mutated are hot spots in the mesh, and then it allows the heat to diffuse out. And what this does is uh, genes that are heavily connected, like p53, tend to lose heat a lot because they're so connected. So it downweights them. Uh, and so it, it does a better job at, um, at clustering. And in fact, the Reactome, the, the Reactome Cytoscape plugin now offers Hotnet as an alternative clustering algorithm. It will, give, it will take a little longer to run, but will give you a better set of, better set of modules. Um, uh, 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 Yuri's um, um, thesis project is hype, is, uh, includes hypermodules which is a, uh, uh, an algorithm that, uh, identi that uh, searches for network clusters that involve your mutated genes, your genes of interest, that correlate with clinical characteristics. So it does, um, so you give it um, the, uh, uh, you, you give it tables of uh, your uh, patients, if you're studying a series of patients, clinical characteristics such as disease-free survival and the genes that are mutated in those patients. And it, it specifically searches for clusters which, uh, uh, which vary, co-vary with those clinical characteristics. And then Reactome that I discussed, that I discussed before has both our, uh, rea um, uh, our own uh, clustering algorithms in there as well as ones that we've imported and re-implemented that were developed by other people. So now we talk about pathway-based pathway-based mod, uh, modeling. So in so the deficiency of the of uh, network clustering is that it's throwing out a lot of the the, 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 the temporal and mechanistic information that that are they're in pathway databases they, by adopting this much more much simpler model. Uh, so pathway-based modeling attempts to preserve those detailed biological relationships. And, uh, and, and, and produce quantitative models um, of the representing the effects of your, uh, of your, your list of altered, uh, altered genes, proteins, and RNAs. And it's shading into systems, bio systems biology at this point. Uh, so this is a much less, this is, um, um, this is much more cutting edge, much harder for people to, uh, to, to run if they are not um, uh, compu not uh, computer scientists and uh, computational biologists themselves, uh, and they also tend to be much more specialized for particular problems. So the older and most well-developed class of pathway-based models are uh, partial differential equations and Boolean and Boolean models, such as uh, an application called CellNet Analyzer. These were developed for me uh, for biochemical systems, metabolomics. Uh, and are great at predicting, for example, the rate of production of, cert of a certain small molecule in a re yeast fermentation reaction. Uh, they really only scale to small numbers, small numbers of genes, like a dozen at most, and require uh, inputs of reaction constants, 
uh, and bind, binding, binding constants, KMs and the like, and probably not very, very useful to anyone doing cancer analysis. There are network flow models, um, such as NetForest and NetworkKin, which were developed specifically for, uh, cert uh, for certain types of signaling cascades, such as kinase cascades and phosphorylation info, info phosphorylation um, uh, cascades. Uh, and so if you're working in um, that, that particular domain and you have the proteomics data, which uh, of uh, uh, for phosphorylation, desphosphorylation reactions and their byproducts, then uh, these models are, are for you. Uh, if you're working with a large set of RNA expression arrays or RNA seq arrays, and you have a number of perturbations, such as cell line that's been treated with um, uh, a series of, um, of, of small molecule uh, <coughs> drugs or a series of SHRNAs. There are a series of perturbations all in the same cell line and you've captured a microarray from each one. You can use um, tools such as Arachne from the um, uh, uh, Andrea Califano's lab at Columbia to create a transcriptional regulatory model of the um, uh, of that transcriptional of the transcriptional network that is affected by the perturbations and find master things like master regulators so switches transcriptional regulatory switches that control large numbers of target genes that is very useful <clears throat> and then the most general form um, and the most recent one. Um, are probabilistic graph models such as Paradigm from the um, uh, from Joshua Stewart's group at University of uh, uh, California Santa Cruz, and this is a uh, I'm going to talk about this in more detail, but it's a it's a very general form of pathway modeling that uh, was developed specifically for cancer genome analysis, um, and uh, that, that's what I'm going to I'm going to tell you tell you about. So the way paradigm works is it takes a curated pathway. Here's a very, very simple, uh, simple version of apoptosis, which only has two genes in it, uh, p53 uh, and MDM2, an inhibitor. Okay, and then it uh, uh, it then uh, turns this into a graph, which captures each of the steps in the central paradigm. So MDM2 gets expanded into the MDM2 DNA gene. It's transcribed into an RNA. The RNA is, transcri is translated into, a pr uh, into the MDM2 protein. And then the MDM2 protein can become activated and uh, give rise to activity. Same thing for P53. And then there is a interaction between MDM2 active protein and uh, p53 it's actually a ubiquinylation reaction which inactivates p53 so there's uh, a an interaction here uh, and then each of these uh, uh, each of these transitions is assigned a weight a probability that they occur okay and then from this you can apply your cancer alteration data let's say you have a uh, a, a mutation that affects the gene, an observed change in the RNA, uh, a copy number change in the p53 gene, maybe some mass spec data showing uh, sh uh, showing um, uh, changes in the quantity of, of, uh, of um, unmodified p53 protein. Uh, it will then, uh, if you you give give um, uh, paradigm. A series of such uh, of such observations and attempts to fit them to a model. It create, it, it establishes parameters and weights uh, associated with this model, which explains uh, attempts to explain how changes in the MDM2 gene will affect the um, affect the activity of the apopto of the apoptosis pathway. Okay, um, and then. Once you've it's once uh, it's been trained um, on a large number of cancer cases, you can then run it in inference mode, and it'll tell you for any particular 
um, a patient with a specific set of mutations and other alterations, what the integrated effect of all the mutations you've seen are. So you might have a mutation here, a copy number change there, a fusion protein here, and it'll attempt to tell you whether apoptosis is up, down, or unchanged. And so this, surprisingly enough, this, this actually works extremely well, given the amount of uncertainty here. Here is a, a, um, a, a copy of uh, Josh Stewart's um, bioinformatics page, uh, paper from 2010. And what this is showing is the TCGA glioblastoma multiforme data set, which you've been working with, um, uh, in which um, uh, each patient has been... Uh, uh, has been run through paradigm for the GATA pathway, E2F, EGFR, HIF1 alpha, and a series of others. What we're looking at are, are pathways going down and, uh, uh, and patients going across, or donors going across, and the heat map here shows the change in the activity of each of those pathways. And what we're seeing here are actually very dramatic differences from one patient group to another when expressed as, as pathway fold pathway fold changes. So the good there's good and bad news about paradigm. The bad news is it's actually very hard to use. It's distributed in source code form. It's very hard to compile. Um, they don't actually give you any pre-formatted pathway models to run your data through. Documentation is poor and it takes a long, long time to run. Uh, the good news is that um, because I'm enthusiastic about um, the algorithm, um, uh, Guan Ming Wu in my group has uh, incorporated it into the uh, into the Reactome Cytoscape app, so you can run it within the Cytoscape app. Uh, it's not quite ready to, for prime time yet, so Robin will not be showing you how to use it, um, but it will be ready within uh, a, a couple of months, and. Even better, um, the um, uh, Hussein Radfar, a postdoc in my group, has re-implemented par the paradigm algorithm so it runs it runs um, uh, uh, 50 times faster than the original version. So instead of taking weeks to get a result, you can get the result in minutes, which makes it possible to actually use it in an interactive way. And so I I'd hoped that it would be ready to show to you today, but it's not quite not quite ready. We also pre-populate it with a series of pathway models from, from Reactome. So look for that soon. That's the end of the talk here. Um, I, and then I have a series of URLs. And then, um, yeah, right. And then there are, uh, that's not true actually. And then there are more, um, more uh, detailed references in the, uh, the preprint that's up on the wiki. So I'm trying to understand when would you use a pathway-based model versus a uh, reactive or a, a network-based model? A network-based model. What question would you ask? Yeah. You well, so uh, um, the so I think I think uh, you know ultimately in order to understand if you want if you want to get a kind of a general idea of what pathways and processes are altered in your, uh, in your system of it, in, in the system that you're working on. So you have a hundred different examples of, uh, of a sarcoma, and you want to understand what's frequently, ch what pathways are, fr are driving sarcoma, then any of these methods uh, is, is, uh, is going to give you that, is going to give you that, that list of driver pathways. And you can use the, the, the easiest and fastest one of gene set enrichment for that. If you want to understand, um, uh, if you want to find subclasses of uh, um, uh, subtypes of tumors, then gene set enrichment will not work, may not work so well, and you would want to go to the next step and, and use the cluster, clustering, uh, the net, network extraction and clustering systems, because those are actually very good at finding subtypes. If you want to go beyond that and, add, and, and start developing kind of precision medicine, asking precision medicine questions, what, um, you know, pathways are affected in a particular patient, and how is it affected, and what drug might I give that patient to reverse those changes? 
or to search for synthetic lethals. Then you need to do modeling. And that's when you'd, you'd want to go to the, more the most more sophisticated pathway-based modeling uh, approaches. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. So we, uh, these pathways are created using biology of knowledge. Yeah. Can, can we further enrich our biology knowledge from these pathways? I mean, I feel like they're restricted to what we know so far. Can, can we, based on what we observe in these pathways, can we enrich our biology? Well, so, uh, so you know, a, uh, uh, I, you know, the, 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 short, the short answer is yes. I mean, you know, this is, so what, what the pathway analysis and pathway network analysis does is it puts your, you know, puts your, your experimental findings into the context of what's previ uh, previously known biology, which otherwise you would have to, you know, get from the, you'd have to extract from the literature and you, might, you may not be familiar with you know, obscure parts of the literature which um, are relevant. So, for example, axon guidance. Uh, two years ago, nobody thought that axon, no one would have thought of axon guidance uh, signaling pathways in the context of cancer. By putting cancer data into the pathway context, axon guidance, which, you know, had been the domain of neuroscientists, suddenly comes up as a, um, you know, as, as being uh, a, a uh, a pathway involved in tumor metastasis. Uh, so you've now added some biological knowledge to the, you know, um, you know, to the literature, which ultimately will get reincorporated into the pathway databases. Is that, yeah, yeah. The, that really, you know, so you're building on, same thing, uh, you know, everybody in science does. You build on top of, of the previous knowledge, you add new knowledge to it, and then it, 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 it becomes part of the established corpus of uh, information. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, is if you, uh, yeah, I don't think I understood the question. So you have two, you, you, you have tumor and normal? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the question is: Well, if you have tumor in normal, how do you do? How do you do network analysis? Generally, network analysis on it, right? Uh, and the uh, uh, so typically all these all these techniques require you to uh, uh, require you to provide to provide a uh, a, a, a gene list. Um, so you have to go through the um, tumor and normal and decide which genes have changed relative to relative to normal. Um, so for mutation data, it's typically a yes or no. It has a, a functionally significant mutation or not. There's a whole other, as you you've heard, there's a whole other series of um, techniques for deciding when a mutation is, is a significant likely driver mutation. So you have to pre, you have to run those things first in order to come up with a list. If you're looking at RNA expression levels, then you can provide some, but not all of these network systems, a, a full chain, a quantitative full change value. Same thing with copy number changes, which are quantitative. So we can put those on that in the actual, the yeah, yeah, actually you can, yeah. You can put full, you can put full changes in and, and uh, you know, one of the handy things is it'll, you'll, you'll, it'll give you a, um, uh, a pathway diagram with each, with the full change represented as color change. With your so genes. Your genes. genes, yeah, yeah, you say genes A, B, and C are all increased and gene D is uh, decreased and it'll give you a pathway diagram in which 
you know, there are three red boxes for your increased genes and one blue box for the decreased genes. What's the limit of how many genes can be um, practical limit. Uh, Robin, what's the practical limit of how many genes that you can upload into Reactome for a colorization analysis? Um, that's a good question. I don't know if you've really tested the limits in mean, the, the new universal. Yeah. You should take very large files up to 5 or 10 megabytes. So. Well, though, sounds like hundreds, thousands. All right. Any other questions? I'll turn it over to Robin, and I will hang around here too. And uh, maybe more questions will come up as you work through the exercises. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you 